Sound Words, Christian Magazine, Volumes 71 to 80. Republished by Irving Risch, host of Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded podcast. Meditations on the Ark of God, its construction, contents, and coverings. There are three arcs of which we have often heard the ark built by Noah, the ark into which Moses was placed by his parents, and the ark of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Each has its own peculiar lessons for us, but all three bring before us the thought of salvation. Noah prepared an ark for the salvation of his house, the ark of bulrushes brought salvation to the child Moses, and the ark of Jehovah was the means used by God to bring his people safely over Jordan, and to overthrow the power of their adversaries at Jericho. The varied descriptions of the ark of shittim wood and gold display the precious thoughts of God concerning Christ, the one whom we see in this divine symbol. It is called, the ark of Jehovah, the ark of the testimony, the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord of all the earth, the ark of the Lord God, the ark of our God the Ark of Jehovah the God of Israel, and the Ark of Thy Strength. Each of these designations gives the Ark a distinctive character appropriate to the context in which it is found. Shittim wood was used to make the Ark. It was also the material used in the construction of the tabernacle and its various articles of furniture, and nowhere else in scripture is it spoken of. It has been called imperishable acacia. There can be little doubt that it brings before us the humanity of our Lord Jesus, a humanity that was real and perfect. The Son of God became man in order that we might be identified with him on the resurrection side of death in a humanity that brought delight to the heart of God. When the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews speaks of the ark, he does not mention the shittim wood, but says it was covered round in every part with gold. He is calling attention to the glory of Jesus, to his divinity, to the divine nature, the divine righteousness and the divine glory that faith can discern in him. A holy mystery surrounds the inscrutable union in the Son of God of the natures of his Godhead and manhood. We know that he was perfect man, partaking in all that constituted and belonged to manhood, and entering into the conditions and circumstances that belonged to men in the most real way, and at the same time he was God. The fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him, one who perfectly set before men what God is in his nature and disposition towards men, and setting forth what man is according to the thoughts, desires and will of God. The border of gold around the ark no doubt signified the personal glory of the Christ, the golden rings and the staves telling that God would have his testimony carried about according to his own thoughts. And in keeping with the glory and dignity of him in whose person the testimony of God was set forth. Forming the lid of the ark was the mercy seat of pure gold, that which formed the throne of God in the midst of his people. Where God appeared in the cloud of glory, Leviticus chapter 16 verse 2, which merged with the cloud of incense, and from which he spoke to Moses, from between the cherubims, Numbers chapter 7 verse 89. The golden cherubims looked towards the mercy seat, as viewing the redemption that secured the glory of God in relation to the question of sin. In Eden, the cherubim safeguarded the tree of life, lest man in sin should forever live in this condition. In the temple that Solomon built they looked towards the house as witnesses of the display of the divine glory that redemption had procured, in Revelation chapter 5, along with the redeemed of earth. They celebrate in praise the Lamb of God. From Romans chapter 3 verse 25, we learn God's thoughts of the mercy seat, where it is written, whom God has set forth a mercy seat, through faith in his blood, for the showing forth of his righteousness. In respect of the passing by the sins that had taken place before. God was able to view the sins of his own, in past dispensations, in the light of the coming work of his Son upon the cross. The blood-sprinkled mercy seat in the tabernacle foreshadowed this great work, which was the basis of God's forbearance before Christ came. Now that Christ has come, and the great work of redemption has been accomplished, God is made known in the Gospel as just, and the justifier of all that have faith in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4, there are three things found in the ark. The first of which is the golden pot that had manna. Manna was the food of the mighty, that God provided for the sustenance of his people throughout the desert journey, food, from its careful description. That speaks of Christ once humbled here. If we are to be in this world for the pleasure of God, we shall have to feed on Christ. Nothing will strengthen us for the desert journey like the prayerful contemplation of what Christ was as man in this world for the will and pleasure of God. Christ as the food of his people is brought before us in many ways, he is, the old corn of the land, the grapes of Eskol, the meat offering, the peace offering, and, the showbread. Each having its own peculiar significance, and strengthening for some particular function or service, but the manner was for all the people at all times. As is the contemplation of Christ in his holy life of devotion to God's will in manhood here. What the manner presented to God was so precious to him that he commanded Moses to lay up before him, in a golden vessel, an omer of the food he had provided for Israel. 
The golden vessel indicates to us the glorified Christ, and in Christ glorified there is the treasured remembrance for the pleasure of God the Father all that his Son was for him as a man on earth. The time came when Israel despised that light bread, but what Israel despised, God delighted in, and Israel despised and ill-treated the Christ of God when he was on earth, but God has glorified the Christ that they rejected. To the overcomer of Pergamos, Christ gives the promise, him will I give to eat of the hidden manna, Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. This is no doubt a promise of future blessing, what the saints shall enjoy in heaven in a coming day, the enjoyment of God's own thoughts of his son as the man of sorrows here. But even now, while we feed on Christ as the manna to sustain us for the path of God's will through this world, we can also, while in communion with the glorified Christ in heaven, find pleasure in what he was for God as a man in this world. Aaron's rod that budded lay beside the golden pot inside the ark, another relic of the desert way. Korah and his company had challenged the leadership of Moses and the priesthood of Aaron, and in so doing had called in question the prerogative of God to choose his own servants. After the judgment of God had fallen upon the profane Korah and his followers, and also upon those who accused Moses and Aaron of being responsible for their judgment, Jehovah commanded Moses to bring twelve rods, each with the name of a prince representing his tribe written upon it, and to lay them up before him in the tabernacle of witness. On the morrow, when Moses went into the tabernacle, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds, Numbers chapter 17 verse 8. The choice of the house of Levi had been confirmed, the priesthood of Aaron had been divinely attested in resurrection power. Does not this teach us that Christ has been called as God's high priest, after the power of an endless life? Hebrews chapter 7 verse 16. Raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Christ has entered upon his priestly work in all the fragrance of the blossoms that tell of what he was to his Father in life and in death. And as having secured fruit for God's glory and praise, not only in his own holy life, but as the result of his having been found in death for the accomplishment of all God's will. The two tables of stone, the tables of the covenant, were also in the ark. On the tables were written the Ten Commandments, God's righteous demands of what man should be both towards himself and towards his neighbor. Alas! No man had answered to the divine commands. Even the Apostle Paul who could not be convicted by men of having broken them, for he wrote, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, Philippians chapter 3 verse 6, has to say, I had not known lust. Except the law had said, thou shalt not covet, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, Romans chapter 7 verses 7 to 9. The very best under the law are convicted by the commandment, thou shalt not covet. There was not found a man who loved the Lord his God with all his heart, and his neighbor as himself. Yet there was one man who answered perfectly to every commandment of the law, who magnified the law and made it honorable. The testimony of God was secure in the heart and life of him of whom the ark spoke, even in Jesus the Son of God, who could challenge all around with the words. Which of you convinceth me of sin? John chapter 8 verse 46. Not only did he love the Lord his God with all his heart, and his neighbor as himself, but in him there was the revelation of God's love, and the hatred of men to him was met by perfect love and all the evil of men by the perfection of goodness. For its journeys, the ark was first to be wrapped in the covering veil of the tabernacle, whose variegated colors bring out the features of Jesus, the blue speaking of his being, the second man out of heaven, the purple. His traits and glories as son of man, the scarlet, that he was son of David, the fine twined linen, the practical righteousness exhibited in all his steps, and the cherubim. His judicial character for the securing of all God's will. Faith alone discovers the secrets of the covering veil, for over it was, the covering of badger's skins, hiding the beautiful colors, and protecting them, and the ark, from the gaze of men. But the blue was evident to all, for a covering of blue was over the badger's skins. All could see that, although the Lord Jesus was a man in outward appearance like other men, he was a different kind of man, altogether heavenly in his manner of life. Even as he claimed to have come down from heaven. Every feature connected with the ark brings something of Christ before us, that which is for our edification, our instruction, and pleasure, that to which it is our privilege to bear about in testimony during our sojourn in this world. To manifest the features of Jesus as we speak of him, so that he might be magnified in our lives, and God glorified in his royal priesthood. Who, show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9.